I am so delighted to be sitting here on Zoom with um, my new friend, Sissy Goff. So Sissy, thank you for being here with us today. I'm so delighted to be on here with you with Zoom, and I'm so delighted to be new friends. Both oh, things. Me too. So I know. We got to send each other books and talk about people we know in common. And um, also, I got, and this is one of my favorite things about podcasting, that I feel like, um, especially since I have not been to many conferences since the pandemic, uh, so it's been a couple of years, and I feel like when I used to go to conferences, I would meet up with people like you, people who I'd heard about and thought, oh, great, I'll finally have a chance to meet them in person and get to talk about stuff. And I, I get feel like I get to do that now through this podcast where I read someone's book and then I get to talk to them about it. So I am really delighted to get to do that with you. And I'll tell for listeners who don't have this book yet, I just read Sissy's book, The Worry-Free Parent, Living in Confidence So Your Kids Can Too. And that's what we get to talk about today. Um, although you also sent me your other beautiful books. So we can just send people down like a whole trail of <laughs> really important resources and information, um, mm -hmm. not just in terms of parenting, but in terms of actually being like humans who are healthy yes. and whole. So anyway, thank you for that. Um, I guess let's just start with why this book, why a book, you know, which is really as much for parents to learn and grow themselves as it is to learn and grow as parents, right? Can you just talk about that a little bit? Yes. It's my first book that's geared towards parents for parents. Mm -hmm. And I have been counseling kids and families for 30 years, which I can't even believe. It's been 30 years. And I usually am writing out of whatever I feel like the need is in the moment, the thing I'm most sure. concerned about. And and post, I mean, really leading up to the pandemic, I was watching it, the anxiety ramp up in kids, but in parents too. And I had written a book for parents about girls and I'd written a book for elementary age girls and then one for teenage girls. And I just was becoming more and more concerned about parents. And post pandemic, it is more rampant than I've ever seen before. And, you know, the cool thing is I do believe parents are more anxious, but I also believe they're more intentional and thoughtful than I've ever mm -hmm. known them to be. So I was sitting with a lot of parents who were saying things like, I think I'm making it worse. I think mm. what's going on with me is spilling over onto them and I don't know what to do. And so I just, I wanted to put, you know, I, I'm so aware, which I'm sure you are too, in different parts of the country, counseling is harder to come by. And, and right. so I wanted to put something in folks' hands that it felt like if they can't get to counseling or they're having trouble finding a counselor that they like and trust and connect with, I wanted there to be something that they could, a place to start of things they could try at home. And there's a, a companion workbook that makes it kind of a deeper dive just to say, mm -hmm. hey, try all these things. And if it feels like at the end of a couple of months, you're not seeing the needle move at all, then I think it's time to go ahead and find a counselor. But at least this is the first six weeks of counseling I would do in my office. Yeah, that's a great point. And I do will say for anyone who hasn't actually uh, picked up this book yet, that each chapter is its own little workshop. I mean, and I say that mm, in a really positive sense. You. And there is a sense of also take what you need and leave what you don't because you give so many pieces of kind of practical try this, try this, look at this, look at that, you know, um, lists and opportunities for people to really evaluate and grow. So it is a chock full of resources. Um, well, you know, but, us Enneagram ones, we're just trying to give all the helpful, practical things we can, Amy Julia. So true. I know. Yes. I, um, I, for listeners, Sissy and I have bonded over the fact that uh, two things, actually, we are both wearing stripes in case you're just listening <laughs> and not seeing this. Um, and two, that we are both Enneagram ones. And if you don't know what the Enneagram is I won't go into a deep dive at all, but it does mean that we both have somewhat perfectionistic tendencies. Um, but I think there is a desire to like be good and right mm. and helpful and, and have integrity and that shows up in your work for sure. Wow. That's kind. And I think it means, I won't speak for you, at least for me, it means I'm anxious <laughs> and didn't know what it was when I was growing up. And so my coping skill I developed was just being highly productive, aka control. And that's kind of how I dealt with it. So I always joke I with parents still, who are perfectionists. I'm know. like, hello, you're anxious. <laughs> yes. I I want to get back to that because I still find that I have these coping mechanisms and one of them is hyper productivity. Um and yes. yeah. So we're gonna we're gonna come back to that. But first I realized <laughs> I would like to 
talk about like, what is anxiety? Is that different from worry? Is it different from fear? Like, what do we mean when we use these words? And also, how do these things affect us and our kids? Mm. Yes. So the way I would describe it, you know, fear, I think happens in the presence of what we're afraid of. So I'm afraid of snakes, but I don't, nothing in my body registers when I say that, you know, it's just a thing. But if a snake all of a sudden came in my little library, I mean, mm. I would lose my mind. You know, it would, <laughs> it would definitely register in my body. And so fear is, in a lot of ways, fear is easier to work with. And it's an adaptive mechanism in our body to keep us alive. Fear is okay. adaptive. Now, worry and anxiety are maladaptive. Mm. And so with worry, I think we worry about kind of vague things. It, it, it's a little bit more pervasive. All of us worry in this day and time. And I would, you know, I read in the research for this book, one of the things I read that I thought was interesting is just a definition of anxiety that says anxiety is a response to cumulative stress over time, Mm -hmm. which that even in itself makes me feel like I think in 2020, I don't know when this is coming out, 2023, 2024. 2023. Yep. Yeah. I mean, we're all anxious to some degree. I mean, there's no way for us not to be based on what's going on in the world what went on in our lives during the pandemic, what's still going on that might be some holdover for the kids that we love. You know, there are just yeah. a lot of things. But I, but the way I describe anxiety with kids, you know, we all have hundreds potentially of what are considered intrusive thoughts every single day. When we're anxious, the intrusive thoughts come in and they get stuck. And mm. so with kids in my office, I talk about it like the one loop roller coaster at the fair. You know, that this thought comes in and it just circles around and around and around and they, we have no idea how to get it out. And so, and, and what's interesting, Amy, Julia, if I were to like line up, if I had a group of kids on here with me of different ages, I could predict for you what their loops will be about because Mm. it changes through development. Little ones, it's often being away from their mom or dad, something bad happening to them. They get a little bit older and. I can't even count the amount of kids I have seen who have been at a birthday party or at school and someone throws up and now they can't stop thinking about throwing up. And to the degree that they're, of course, their little bodies get on board and their bodies start to feel nauseous. And so then we get older and it morphs again into my friends aren't going to like me anymore. I'm going to trip in the track meet. And then we get to parents who say things to me all the time, like I never had any anxiety until I had kids. because. The thing that matters the most to you as a parent matters more than anything ever has in your whole life. And so, of course, that's where your loop is. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I remember as a young mom lying in bed and trying to figure out how do I interrupt thoughts about uh, water and cars, you know, just with my, my toddlers wandering out into the road or, you know, wandering into the water um, without ha- being equipped to protect themselves. And, yes. uh, that was a real challenge. And, and I have, and I, I have not had those types of fears about myself, right? Like that, it felt new to be in, in that loop. I've had plenty mm. of anxious loops in my life, but that sure. did feel really new as a parent yes. for sure. Yeah. Yes. Well, so how do we know as parents, like that, One of the things you write about is how, you know, anxiety is contagious. And especially if we are anxious as parents, it will not only affect our kids because of our behavior, but it actually is more likely to therefore pass on anxiety to them. Right. So Mm -hmm. how do we know if that's happening? Like, are there signs that we can look out for where it's like, you know what, this is like, you know, for lack of a better word, harming your child. (laughs) So maybe you want to pay attention to it, you know? Yeah. I mean, I think there are definitely signs that it's happening. One of those is, you know, when we get anxious, what's happening is the amygdala of our brain is taking over, which is the fight or flight region of our brain. And the the blood flow has shifted and left the prefrontal cortex and it's all gone to the amygdala. So it's why parents say my child's like a crazy person when they get anxious. Mm. Right. So are we. And so I would say if you feel, and I think there's this thing that happens I'm sure you lived in a dorm at some point along your college career. Yes. Quite a few times, in fact. Yes, yes. So you remember that whole thing that would happen where one person starts their period and then everyone on the hall is 
sure. on their period. You know, I think there's something that literally happens where one amygdala takes over and then everybody <laughs> in the near vicinity does too. And so the child's having a meltdown and all of a sudden you find yourself doing the same or you start to get really anxious and tense and your kids do too. I mean, I think at that point, that's what's happening is anxiety is all of a sudden infiltrating our whole family. And so that's where I think we need to, to rein it in and figure out some tools we can use. But I think too, if I really would want any parent of a child that you're starting to see some symptoms of anxiety, you're seeing them show more fear socially, you're seeing them start to fixate on certain things. Mm -hmm. One of the, the interesting, you know, 30 years of doing this work, there are trends that I see and I'm seeing anxiety show up right now in kids more as obsessive compulsive types mm. of tendencies. And so if you're seeing that in your child, I always want a parent to just stop for a minute and look a little bit of, at themselves and see, yeah. is this happening inside of me? Do we have a family history? Because if we do, I want to stop their progression. And, and my child is not going to be able to move toward health if I'm not doing the same. I, there was one um, line, very short sentence in your book that I like circled and starred. A grown-up's job is to be the calmest person in the room. And I, I do think this is an area I've grown in, but recognizing that when I match my children's emotion with the same or elevated, like I can show you that I've got more <laughs> anger, you know, it's like not helping. <laughs> and in fact, my job is not to just um, kind of give in to whatever their emotion is, I mean, it, but actually to remain calm and be with them in that um, yes. in, some, in some way. But that has taken a lot for me to learn how to not, as you just described, kind of amp the anxiety um, up, up, up instead of saying, okay, I've learned more, hopefully as an adult, about what this is, how to address it, how to identify it, and I can bring that non-anxious presence into this um, scenario. Easier yes. said than done, but what I well, would want. And I think, I think part of what's so hard about this, I mean, I sit with parents all the time who will say they won't stop until I get really big, until right. I'm yelling yes. even. And so I yes. think in some ways we've trained them to not listen until we get to that place. That means we mean business. Mm. And and when we're all elevated, because our thinking brain is not even online, they're not hearing us. We're not getting, there's nothing productive or helpful that comes out of a conversation when everyone's screaming or everyone's right. upset in that way. And so I think if your tendency is to get bigger, you know, I think about the bear, what you're supposed to do. I think if your tendency is to do that, then I would say flip it and get down on their level and quiet your voice. Mm -hmm. And and it might even be scarier for them <laughs> in a positive way. Well, right. and it, actually, before I say that, I, I think every family needs a code word that when everybody's starting to get elevated, that one of us says watermelon mm. or whatever the word is, and we take a break. Because to try and reverse and get smaller in that moment is going to be really hard. And they can't, until we can calm our bodies down, we can't move out of the amygdala anyway and back to the prefrontal cortex. So we've got to take a pause. And then I think we can get quieter and lower mm -hmm, mm -hmm. to get to a more reasonable Yeah. Process. And I think some of the, you know, pr like practices of reflection, at least for me, in noticing, um, I have one child in particular that I'm the most likely to get amped up with of our three kids. And Angel, yeah, I love that you know that. What a gift to that child <laughs> that you're aware of it. Well, and you know, I really do um, credit a lot of um, people like you for helping me learn. And also the fact that they're in a Montessori school, <laughs> helping me learn how to actually meet um, this child as a child and not just uh, assuming that we should be operating somewhat as equals and that everything I know, they should also know. And um, But one of the things that has helped me has been actually doing it wrong a lot and having to like reflect back on that and think, I know, and, and this, I remember having this conversation in which um, one of my kids came home and said, 
um, they were talking about another friend who had gotten to go to Disney World five times. And the reason this friend has gone to Disney World five times is because their grandparents live in Orlando. So it was not as though, <laughs> you know, like, we live in Connecticut. I mean, it's just, yeah, it was just this not kind a quick of outlandish jump. thing. And, you know, I was calm for maybe two exchanges. And then I finally, I mean, I just lost it and, you know, made grandiose statements about how you think that you're entitled to everything that everyone else has, you know, all these terrible things. So that to me was like the pinnacle of my reactive getting big. And I, you know, it was basically, I really felt like as a parent, I either needed to fix the problem, which would mean going to Disney World every year in my <laughs> thinking, or mm -hmm. I needed to squash the problem, which was essentially, I'm going to like beat you as a, not physically beat you, but I'm going to win over you yes. um, by winning this argument and making you understand, you know, what a petty person you are, <laughs> eight-year-old or whoever, what, I don't know what age. Um, and so that moment was just stands out to me as a parent, because I just knew I'm, I've put myself into the scenario, neither side, neither one of my solutions works mm. and there has to be another way. How can I honor the feelings that my child is having that, if, I mean, sh like right now, this child feels really um, like there's injustice in the world. <laughs> Like my parents don't really care about me. I mean, those are real <laughs> feelings. They're yes. not actually true. Like, so, so what do I do? And um, I didn't, it's not as though I kind of figured that out immediately, but at least being able to do it wrong and then reflect back on that um, started to help me actually make some progress in learning how to uh, not just react with my own anxiety, essentially. I mean, because that's really what that was. My anxiety of not being a good enough parent, which is, uh, again, as an Enneagram one, what comes in so often is like, I'm not good enough. And you are telling me I'm not good enough. So I'm going to yell at you <laughs> for that. <laughs> well, no, but I I mean, I'm, I'm going to back up. Well, two things. One is, I love that Richard Rohr said, we grow more by getting it wrong than by getting it right. Yes. And, and that's exactly what you're talking about. And Amy, Julia, the fact that you dug into that, felt like you failed and dug into it to try and figure out what to do differently is beautiful. And really, I would say is such a gift to that mm. child. And I am hearing more parents who feel like failures and who are losing it, talk, who are willing to say, I lost it with my child, which mm -hmm. I'm so grateful when parents feel like they can say that. And, and my response is always, I think you're getting angry, not because you're some terrible parent or you failed, but because in fact, it's the opposite and you want really good things for your child. I mean, in that moment, you could look at it like, you know, every switch got flipped because I felt like they were being entitled and ungrateful and had these unrealistic expectations. Or you could look at it like, I want so much for my child to have humility and mm -hmm. gratitude and to be a person like that in the world. And yep. it feels like my job to help them grow into that, to it. And so of course I felt anxious when I see the opposite and, and it's really because I want good things for them. And so yeah. that is one of the things I hope parents get the most through the book is not only does it mean you're a good parent if you're getting angry, but there's a way to flip the thought to a more positive place. Because I think so often when we get angry at ourselves and start to beat up on ourselves, I always think it's like when I snow ski, which I don't do a lot and I don't do very well, but if I fall once, I fall five more times in the next hour because mm. I get so tense and so tight right, that right. I can't even ski the right way. I don't even have rhythm anymore. And I think mm -hmm. that's what we do as grownups. We fail once and then we get so mad at ourselves that it's like the anger then creates more of an issue than the fact that we failed once and we can learn from it and receive grace there. Yeah. And you even write about um, like the importance of certainly this, what we're talking about in terms of kind of failure and learning from it as adults, but also you talk about like that being important, like the, the process of failing and talking about it in front of our kids as something that's important, even when it comes to the anxiety loops and all the different things that happen there. Can you say a little bit more about that? 
Yes. My coworker, David Thomas, who's like the boy version of what I do at Daystar, he says all the time, kids learn more from observation than information. And so if they're watching us mess up and get mad at ourselves on one hand, or on the other, if we're trying so hard to be this perfect parent, then when they hit that age of awareness of, oh, I mess up and kind of a lot, then they think that's not okay because my parents never mess up. They're these perfect Mm -hmm. parents. And so I think when we can, I mean, I'm saying this to parents of perfectionists all the time. I want you to fail in front of them. Mm -hmm. I want you to talk about what it's like to work through that. And I want you to laugh at yourself in the process because I mean, you and I, I mean, again, I I don't mean to speak for you, Amy, Julia, but I think typically (laughs) we perfectionists are so intense when we fail. We don't know how to laugh at ourselves. And I can't even fathom if someone had showed me what that looked like at eight, that I could blow it, that I could disappoint people and that they still loved me, that I was okay. They were okay with me. I mean, what an immense difference that would have made in my life. And so to help kids, and I would say, I mean, definitely perfectionist, perfectionistic kids of boys or girls. But I think girls, I read a study years ago that talked about when something goes wrong in a boy's world, he blames someone else. And when something goes wrong in a girl's world, she blames herself. Yeah. Which is part of why I think girls are twice as likely to deal with anxiety as boys. That's why. And women, we're leading the statistics. And so I think Mm. when we can start to give ourselves more grace, I just, I think it would be a game changer for us. Mm. And for them. Yeah, such a good point. And I did not learn what I learned how to do was how to avoid failure at all costs, which is to say not take risks, not um, grow. I mean, I really Mm -hmm. did not learn how to even little things like um, this is a story my husband and I tell about me often, which is that when uh, we were dating in college one day, he said, "Um, hey, you want to go shoot? basketballs and I'm five foot one. He's six foot tall. So I was like, uh, no, that's okay. And he's like, why not? (laughs) I was like, I've I've never done that before. And he was like, oh, okay, well, let's just go try. And I was like, no, I've I've never done it before. So we have this big back and forth where we're just not understanding each other because what I'm saying in I've never done that before is therefore I will be bad at it. And therefore I will not try. And he's saying, I understand that you're a foot shorter than I am and that you've never done it before. Maybe you'll think it's fun. Like, I'm not going to judge you. I'm not going to critique you. And I was almost in tears, simply standing in front of the basket, trying to shoot, you know, like it was so, and and we eventually had fun. Like we played and had fun, but it was such this moment of me recognizing I have oriented my life around not being in a position of even possibly failing, which you can't fail at going out in the driveway with someone and shooting a basketball, right? I mean, you can't. And yet that's what it felt like to me. And and so we've really tried in our household. That's one thing we have tried because I think he and I learned this about me early on to uh, try to, yeah, really kind of try new things, demonstrate when that's hard, talk about taking risks, you know, that kind of thing. And we also, is one of the most... um endearing qualities of our daughter, Penny, who is our oldest child and who has Down syndrome, is that she laughs at herself when she uh, makes a mistake really, really easily. And it's so welcoming it's to everyone, you mm. know, I, I, um, and and it's really been a gift to our whole family. And I don't know if that is kind of common among kids with Down syndrome or not, or if it's just particular to her, but I, I know that I really do appreciate it, which has helped me recognize, oh, it's actually a welcoming thing to other people if I can um, be gracious to myself and yes. kind of enjoy myself, not as someone who has to get it right all the time. Yes. Yes. I love that. I love that story. And, and I think especially because one of the things in this age of anxiety and perfectionism, I'm seeing more kids than ever who will not do things that they can't already do well, who won't even learn sports, who won't try things because they want to do it perfectly from the outset, which is crazy and makes me so sad. I mean, I get it. And it makes me so sad. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I I want to talk about parents again because okay. I have a couple of questions for uh, kind of two different um sets of parents. I'm thinking about people who know that they have a lot of anxiety. That that's just something they've known about themselves maybe even since they were 
children or teenagers. Um, and so if you're talking to someone who says, look, I know I have a lot of anxiety. I know it's affecting my kids. Like, where is there a place that you start? Are there um, first steps as far as practices or, you know, other than certainly, and I would recommend this, getting your book and the workbook and possibly a group of people to work through it with. But, yes, you know, if you're idea. just kind of like, oh my gosh, I, I don't have time for that today. What, where do you start? Mm -hmm. Well, I, w I want all of us to be aware at the two places anxiety starts is first is in our bodies mm. and the second is in our thoughts. And so I think anytime we can notice patterns of how it impacts us. So in our bodies, for all of us, I think it starts in a different place. I mean, maybe your shoulders hunch up. I find my shoulders around my ears a lot. Mm -hmm. Maybe your breathing changes. Maybe you're, I'm in the age where I'm having hot flashes. And so my face turns red really mm -hmm. quickly and I get really hot. I mean, again, it's, it's different for everybody, but Basically, the more anxiety takes over our body, the more our amygdala hijacks our brain, the harder it is to fight. And so the sooner we can catch the progression, the better off we are in terms okay. of stopping how it takes over. And so when I first start to notice my body getting tense and registering some anxiety, if in that moment I can take some deep breaths and whether it's, you know, I love square breathing, I love breath prayers. Mm -hmm. Apple watches have an app. There are a million apps out there we can have that just help us walk through an exercise of deep breathing. Yeah. That's going to dilate the blood vessels in our brain and shift, shift the blood flow right back to the prefrontal cortex. Mm. So that's always where I want to start. Now we're talking about parents, but with some kids, they can't start with breathing and they need to start with movement. And so with some kids, we would say, mm. Hey, go run a couple of laps around the kitchen Island, you know, and I think some of us as adults too, it might be that we need to go for a run or go for a walk first because it's yeah. just too hard to get into the breathing space. But that's where I want to start is I want us to calm our bodies down. Yeah. And then I want us to notice the themes that our thoughts take because all of us have themes and it's often things like I always, or I never, or no one ever. It's these, you used the word grandiose earlier. It's these grandiose yes places that we go to that are when anxiety is starting to lie to us, which is true. And it's mm -hmm. fascinating because I think from a, a thinking perspective, we move so much into the place where anxiety really impacts our perception. And, and it, anxiety is based on interpretations, not the actual events. But if we back up and we go really practical again, from a scientific standpoint, basically the more often our amygdala is activated in that way, the more likely it is to be activated. It actually enlarges and develops what's considered a hair trigger response. Mm -hmm. And then the bigger it gets, the more likely it is to lie to us. So it's this self-fulfilling prophecy. Mm -hmm. And so the sooner we can catch it in our body, the sooner we can catch it in our thoughts, the better off we are. And 20 seconds of deep breathing begins a process of resetting the amygdala. So when we can start with that, when we can start to notice, okay, I think my thoughts have totally spun out. I'm going to do some deep breathing in this moment. I'm going to bring my thoughts back to what's true. When we're doing parenting seminars, we're talking a lot about the old stop, drop, and roll fire safety theme. So stop, drop, and flip the thoughts. We're going to stop mm. in the moment, do some breathing, drop the anxious thought, and we're going to flip it to something more positive or some kind of truth that we can anchor ourselves to because then we can stop the way it's hijacking our body and our thoughts. So that would be where I would really start. That's really helpful. And then the other question I have is I'm thinking about there was this place in the book um, where when I read it, it was a long list of different things we can do to kind of help um, when we are having anxious thoughts. And what I wrote in the margins, I'm looking for it right now. Um, but what I wrote in the margins was, oh, this helps me with insomnia. And yes. when I, what I laughed about at that point was like, Oh, because maybe insomnia is about anxiety. <laughs> was like, I was like, That's oh, no, so sissy, good. this isn't about anxiety. It's about in insomnia. <laughs> I was like, oh. Whoops. Mm. Mm. Anyway, I'm not finding yes. the list at the moment. But the reason I bring it up is that I am someone who 
Um, for a long time, I really did not think that I had anxiety. I thought I had perfectionism. I thought I had these other things, but um, because of hyperproductivity and ability to rationalize, like I did, there were there were these tactics I had to kind of contain what I now would say was my anxiety, but they were they were very much just containing it. So I do think they were kind of like putting a box around it that probably made it less terrible. But it was not actually addressing the anxiety. It was just kind of like trying to squeeze it into this little place so that it didn't just take over everything. But so for people like me who don't necessarily know that they have anxiety, like where do where do they start? Like, because I feel like I was someone who was in denial and probably on some mm. level still am, like, mm. as opposed to I know I'm anxious. Tell me what to do. You know, so how, <laughs> what, what do you say? What do you say to people like me? Well, and I, there's a section in the book. There are a lot of sections of five things because I just feel like everybody's so busy. I want us to really kind of boil it down. And there is a place where I talk about the five ways I see anxiety show up the most in parents. But I think it's true of any of us as adults. And let's see if I can remember all of them. One is anxiety distracts us. So we're not in the present moment because anxiety resides in the past or the future. So I've spun Mm -hmm. off into one of those places. I had a mom one time who said to me, it's like, I'm trying so hard to be a good parent that I'm not even parenting, Mm. which makes so much sense. So anxiety distracts us. Anxiety causes us to attach future meaning to present problems. That whole sense of, well, they're not keeping their room clean now, so they're never going to be a functional adult. Right, right. You know, or they're struggling with telling some little white lies. They're never going to be able to have a healthy relationship because they lie all the time. You know, these mm-hmm, mm-hmm. big things that we attach the little issues to when they're growing up, when they're still developing people. And so we don't want to do that to them. Yeah. Anxiety yeah. makes us micromanage. So I think if you find yourself as a micromanager, which we are as as type A, we are the yeah. queens of. You know, where it feels like you can't control the big things. So you lock down on the little ones to control. And I think for me, I don't see details. So if somebody told me to just let the little things go, I don't even know what those are because everything has equal importance to me. Right. So anxiety makes makes us micromanage. Anxiety makes us angry based on exactly what we were talking about before. I think it often comes out that way because we feel out of control in the moment. And... I always hate to say this. I hate to say all these out loud, but this one particularly, one of the things I read in the research for raising worry-free girls is that anxiety in kids is often linked to a lack of parental warmth. Hmm. And it's not that we're not warm inside of ourselves or we can't get to a warm place, but I know for me, when I'm anxious and hyperproductive, like you said, yeah. I literally have to say to myself, sissy, stop with your agenda and smile at the person. Right. Stop and listen to them. I mean, mean, there's no warmth coming from me. And I have sat with so many parents who I think, I know you're warm, but I'm not experiencing it all because you're so fearful about what's happening with your kids. And so I talk about how anxiety takes away our warmth and joy. And again, I think we can get back to it. But if any of those five statements as I say them feel a little make you feel a little squirmy or uncomfortable I think then maybe that's part of what's going on for you well and I loved the part in the book where you even said you can practice being warm like Mm. just that that is something that we uh, like even in the mirror like just we can learn this if you feel like it's impossible I'm too afraid or that's just not who I am or whatever that and that sense of um so many of these things with a little bit and, and not even, I mean, what I love, even this is going back a couple of answers, but just like 20 seconds of breathing makes a tremendous difference. I mean, three minutes of reflection a day, picking one moment to just say, okay, what went wrong there? Like Mm -hmm. these really are actually life-changing. If we do them consistently, they really can change our trajectories a lot. Yes. Um, and, and back to the code word, I bet, I feel like you and I probably mm-hmm. read a lot of the same people. Kelly Corrigan, do you yeah. know? Ke- okay. We had her on our podcast not long ago and she was talking about, she didn't even know that I talk about the code word. And she was talking about how she and her husband, based on who her dad was in her life, I think her dad was really kind, really warm. And so she said, when I get really anxious with my girls, my husband will quietly say to me, face of love. 
Mm. Which says to me, I've got to let go of this intensity, warm up my face, smile at them, look them in the eye and say things like her great book title. Tell me more. You know, that's where I can camp out instead of this rigid, intense place that I, that we all go, I think, when we're feeling anxious. Yeah. And I certainly go there. Um, And it's so interesting to me because one of the things, again, having a child with Down syndrome, I said this to you before we even um, started recording, has been more like a magnifying glass than a Mm. different experience of being a parent, um, where some of the concerns and fears and also um, some of the opportunities to really observe and learn have just been bigger. And one of those was really early on in Penny's life, we heard um, a an actually an autism expert, but um, talk about something called responsive parenting. And he said, you know, what we've learned with kids with autism is that the most effective way to be a parent is to respond to what they are strong in and good at. Because if you're trying to, if you're paying attention to their weaknesses, then what you are doing is saying in this area that's really hard for you, we need to get better. And what that does is it creates a feedback loop where they are struggling. You are generally, in terms of your facial expression, grimacing because you are responding to their struggle. Whereas if you can find something that they love and are excited about or good at or strong in, you probably can actually work on these other skills and develop them. But what happens is you create a joy loop where you're excited, they're excited, and and, and, and basically he was like, smiling at your kid is the best thing you can do. Like that is the most important thing to do as a parent. I don't care if they crawl more quickly than they would because of the exercises. Like, I don't care. I want you to smile at your kid. And it was Mm. truly like transformative for me because of being such a productive, you know, person and wanting to have lists, lists and graphs and charts and say, you know, especially with my first child, you know, how is she going to pr- make her progress? And just to be like, okay, slow down, smile. What does she love? And which is also part of like, who is she? How yes. can you relate to her and not to yes. what the book says she might be doing right now? But um, anyway, I just uh, appreciate that sense of responding that like how we our faces look and how mm. we inter- are interacting with them is just so crucial to who they are becoming and who we are becoming too. Oh, I love that so much. And you know, at, part of what concerns me right now for parents is that I think there are so many experty people out there who are telling pe- parents what they need to do and have really differing opinions. And so I think it's so overwhelming for parents. I'm telling yeah. parents, I want you to pick two or three voices and only listen to them. It's just too much. Yeah. And it's funny as you say that, because I, I think when our, you're younger than I am, but I mean, when, when I was growing up, there were not parenting experts out there. There weren't a lot right. of people to listen to. The one book that my mom read was Dr. Spock. Yep. And the one thing she took away from Dr. Spock was smile at your baby, Mm. which is so funny that that's what you're saying. And, and we haven't gotten to be around each other much, but I have one sister who is 16 years younger than me. And it's, it's funny. If you were around us, the compliment that we both get the most out of anything is that we smile all the time. Mm. And I think it's because mom, that was her one philosophy. I'm going to look at them and I'm going (laughs) to smile at their little faces, you know, Mm. funny. So I, I love, love that, that idea I so, love much. That so much. Yes. All right. Well, so here's a question I have. This is, um, you know, kind of me sneaking in my need for a personal therapy parenting session. <laughs> but, um, but the thing that is hardest for me as a parent right now, and I have 17, 15, and 12 year old. Um, wow. So, you know, that, those You're are in my the thick of it. And I am a, mm-hmm. I mean, such a better parent of teenagers than I was when they were little. So, in general, this is a much easier stage for me. But the thing that is hardest Amy, for me. Amy, Julia, way to go on that. Oh, I thanks. think often perfectionists are the opposite. Oh, you know, I read that and I was like, this yes. is actually, but part of that is because my husband and I have literally lived with teenagers essentially since we were teenagers because he, um, li- we've lived in boarding schools. So we've been, wow. we started out in youth ministry and then have been living amongst teenagers. And I think I'm such a communicator that once kids get to an age where they can even give a little bit of a reason for what's happening and what they're feeling and what they're doing. I'm like, I'm all in for that. Whereas <laughs> when this is just seemingly irrational behavior, I, anyway, 
that's a whole other story. But here's my question. So the hardest thing for me as a parent is that I want to help my kids avoid discomfort. Mm. I want to, when, um, you know, my daughter has been home, stayed home from school sick, but gets invited to a sleepover. I want her to be able to go because I know how much it means to her. But I also really feel like as a parent, it's my job to protect you and have you get some sleep or, you know, yes. when, uh, I mean, just when they're struggling in anything, I want to make it better for them with like a quick fix. Um, and that feels kind of like smiling at them. Like that's what mm -hmm. it feels like bestowing my love for them on them. But I also know that it is potentially like holding them back. So could you just talk about why my attitude might be problematic and also how to have some sort of like discernment, you know, about like, mm -hmm. as a mom, when do you, when do you rush in and say, Hey, let me help you make that better. And, and when do you say, I'm going to let you struggle because I know that's part of your growth. Mm, that is such a hard question. And I, I wouldn't say it's problematic. I would say it's coming from a place of so much love for your kids. And of course mm -hmm. you want good things for them. And, and in light of anxiety, the two most common parenting strategies are escape and avoidance. So I'm going to pull them right out. Okay. And I mean, I think it's true really for any kid who comes upon distress, not just anxious kids, although anxious kids can be so loud and manipulative when they come up on something like that. Mm -hmm. And in the research, the definition I came up with is that anxiety is an overestimation of the problem and an underestimation of themselves. Mm -hmm. And so when we rescue them, we are ba basically affirming that definition, mm -hmm. right? You do need me to step in because you're not capable of doing it yourself, which mm -hmm. is never what we would be intending to. I mean, that's not what we're right. wanting to say, yeah. but that's the message that's received. And so, I mean, I think. I, I often will say to parents, what are two things you're doing for your kids right now that they can do for themselves? And what are two things you're doing for them that they can almost do for themselves? Mm. And I want you to stop doing all four. And so maybe that's a question. Is this something yeah. they can do for themselves or they can almost do for themselves? And I'm not going to take care of it if it is. And I would go back to, I think a good litmus test. I'm such a proponent of empathy and questions with kids. Oh, I hate that you're going through that. That looks so hard. Mm -hmm. I cannot imagine what it would have been like to have that kind of math as a sophomore in high school. Mm -hmm. Or, you know, what I hate that your friends are treating you that way. What do you want to do about it? Or what right. do you think would help? Or what's your game plan here? Questions that basically imply capability. Yeah. And then we listen to them try to work through it. And if it feels like they're floundering and they're, confidence is dropping by the minute, then I think, yeah. you know, maybe it's a time to step in and help. Or if right. they've tried, even yep. in a situation at school with friends, they've tried to talk to the friend, they've even gone to the teacher and nothing is changing. Then at mm -hmm. that point, I think we step in, but, right. but give them an opportunity to try first because kids, I mean, I think we are looking at a significant lack of resilience today among kids. And I think it's that sense of somebody's got to step in and fix this for me because I can't do it myself. I love that. Um, and uh, yeah, that's just such good advice. The, both the empowering questions that kind of, again, say, I'm here with you in this and I'm not going to fix it for you. You know, I, I think mm, yes. that is really great. And then also just um, what a good challenge in terms of two things they could be doing for themselves and two things they almost could do. I need to need to contemplate that a little bit for, for my three. Um, well, I could ask you questions all day, but I'm just going to um, ask one more. And I'm thinking about this book, which again is kind of full to the brim with guidance on how to truly change our patterns of thoughts and behavior. So I thought maybe we could close with a picture of what happens when we start to implement these practices, right? Like, so I'm an anxious parent, mm -hmm. I'm reading this book, I start to actually do some of the things we've talked about in this conversation, some of the things in this book, like what happens? Mm, I think probably the opposite of those five things happen. I think we're more present. I see kids and parents as parents start to work through their own worry. I see kids getting better. Yeah. I mean, I really do believe the best thing you can do for anxious kids is to do your own work. And yeah. so I see kids getting better. I see parents enjoying 
their children more, kids enjoying their parents more. I can think of one family that I really love and respect and the daughter right around the age of onset, which is somewhere between seven and eight. This girl started to get really anxious and we did a lot of work and her mom was very wise and knew she had to do the work alongside her. And so one of the things I'll have kids do is give their worry a name. I love for parents to do it too. And this little girl named her worry monster. We called it Bob. I have no (laughs) idea why she picked the name Bob, but I would see them in my office together. And this mom would say, you know what? Bob has been driving me crazy this week and telling me I can't do all these things and I'm messing up all the time. And I would watch this little girl with her big glasses and her even bigger bow and her face soften. I mean, the Mm -hmm. intensity in her own little face fall away. Like my mom, who's my hero, here's Bob. And she's figuring it out and she's working through it. And that gives me hope that I can too. Yeah. Mm. Well, Sissy, you give me hope that we can too. So thank no, you. Thank thanks, you. Thank Julia. you for your book and um, and for all the work you've done, because I know that your um, counseling practice there in Nashville has been a um, kind of a depth of love and care and compassion for countless kids and their families in the wake of these like very um, kind of mundane and day-to-day problems, as well as in the midst of really um, profound tragedy and loss. So we're just really grateful that you are doing what you're doing and that you're sharing it with the world. Thank you, Amy Julia. I'm so delighted to be with you and I'm grateful for what you're doing and that you're sharing it with the world too. Thank you.